Hi, everybody. I'm Tony Plaheski, one of five investigative reporters here at the Austin American Statesman. And for more than a year, we have been taking an unprecedented look at Texas daycares, and we are now revealing the results of our year-long investigation in a multi-day series called Unwatched. I want to bring in my colleagues here via Google Hangout. Andrea Ball, investigative reporter here at the Austin American Statesman, as well as our colleague, Sean Collins Walsh, also part of our team that has been really taking, again, a, a look at Texas daycares that has never really been done, uncovering things that have never really been studied or looked at. So this project really has been the result of a 12-month investigation that started with, with Andrea Ball. Um, Andrea, can you just sort of walk us through how this all came about, how you had the idea to look at Texas daycares and, and where this all started? Yeah, well, you know, we hear in the news constantly little bits and pieces of uh, situations in daycares where something bad has happened. We'll hear about a boy in a hot car or a child that fell asleep in um, a mattress and will die. So we were covering a local case which um, a young man had been accused of sexually abusing a child. And that made me really start to wonder what was going on in, in daycares in general. Um, so we started looking at the smaller types of them, which are called listed daycares, and they're very little ones. And as I looked at them, I found that quite a few of them had some pretty, pretty bad situations. Um, you know, one daycare had lots of um, it was dirty, and there were razors, and there were liquor bottles and, and all that kind of stuff. And so I sort of broadened the investigation and brought you all into it and asked you the basic question of how safe are Texas daycares? And every time we looked at something, another thing popped up. And Sean, we've called this series Unwatched. Can you describe sort of what exactly we mean by unwatched? Yes, uh, there are two layers to what we mean by unwatched. The first is that the state is in charge of regulating the daycare industry. So there are minimum rules that daycares are supposed to follow. Uh, the state, depending on the type of daycare, inspects them every so often, uh, or sometimes not in this one category of daycares that Andrea was discussing, the listed ones. Um, and the state is really supposed to be watching the daycares. We found that that doesn't happen as often as you would hope, or to an effective degree, or that when they do watch, they can regulate the daycares to make sure they're safe. And then the other aspect of it, of course, is the more obvious one, the uh, idea that the daycares are supposed to be watching the children. And uh, in some of these daycares, there are too many children for one daycare to be able to watch responsibly. Uh, in some of these daycares, one case we have, the woman went out of the room for an hour and one of the children um, strangled themselves in an unsafe sleep position. So there's, there's two layers to, to that title. So I want to get into some of the specifics of our findings. Let's begin really by talking about injuries and deaths that happen at Texas daycares. We found a number of really startling and alarming examples in which children, unfortunately, and of course, very sadly, have died in Texas daycares. And we found a case in Houston, uh, Andrea, involving a mother who was originally told one thing, about her baby's death at a daycare, but then she went on basically her own investigative mission to really find out what exactly happened. Can you tell us about the, the story of Shauna Diaz? Sure. So Shauna was the mother of a little baby named Shane. Um, Shane was about three months old and he was attending a daycare called Bibs and Cribs. His mother um, sent him off to daycare. He was perfectly fine. He was sweet. He was learning to laugh. He was chunky. He was just a perfectly adorable little baby. Um, and then all of a sudden, around four o'clock on, um, on a November day in 2016, Donna Diaz gets a phone call saying, your son is uh, not breathing. You need to get to the hospital. And she just was bewildered and had no idea what possibly could be happening. Um, she finally spends an hour in traffic agonizing before she gets to the hospital and um, there's a sheriff's deputy there and there's all sorts of officials there saying you know was he sick was there anything wrong with him and she said no uh well he eventually the next day passed away um 
nobody knew what happened. Everybody said um, that that it was just sudden um, infant death syndrome. Just it. Um, the daycare operators uh, said that the baby had been placed to sleep on his back, which is what is recommended by doctors and um, child care professionals and the state. And so there didn't appear to be anything wrong uh, that they had kept a very safe sleep environment for this child. So the state ruled that it was, you know, um, not abuse or neglect. Uh, but Shauna, who is uh, a very feisty woman, um, would not believe that. She just refused to accept that her perfectly healthy son suddenly was dead and everything was fine. So she hired a lawyer to help investigate this, to get the records. Um, she looked at, with her lawyer, um, the state investigation, police investigation, autopsy reports, medical reports, all these different things. Uh, and essentially what ended up happening was they couldn't find anything. So just as a Hail Mary, um, what the heck, they decided to depose the operators of the child care. And uh, they go into a conference room, they've got cameras rolling, and they ask one of the daycare providers, uh, how did you find Shane? What happened? And the woman said, well, I went and looked at him and I rubbed him on his back to see if he was okay, essentially. And that's when Shauna and her lawyer said, rubbed him on his back. I thought he was supposed to be on his back. Uh, and they realized at that point that the daycare operator, operators had lied. They admitted lying uh, and said that, no, they had actually placed the baby on his stomach to sleep, um, which put him at risk for SIDS or asphyxiation. And she never would have known that if she hadn't done her own investigation. And that was a case that actually resulted in law enforcement uh, reopening their look at the at what happened in that case. And, and Andrew, remind me, that case is still pending or that investigation is still pending? It is. The, um, the sheriff's office has done their investigation and they have put it into the hands of the district attorney's office in Harris County. And they're just waiting to see what, um, what happens. But Sean, sometimes it can be difficult to actually get a broad and clear picture of child deaths in the state of Texas. And the Austin American Statesman is actually now engaged in, in litigation with the state of Texas over some information about uh, death records and child death cases at daycares. Can you bring us up to speed on, on the status of that pursuit by, by the Statesman? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we started this process in May when we filed a records request to the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services for copies of all their investigations um, on child deaths in Texas daycare five years. They said, uh, after us uh, badgering them for an explanation, basically, they said that uh, state law prevents them from disclosing those records to the public. Uh, their legal reasoning was a little squishy to us. We had our lawyers look at it and we ended up filing suit in August for those records. That case is still pending, but recently, earlier uh, this month, the state attorney general's office issued a ruling um, and they are involved in records disputes under state law. They issued a ruling siding with us on a lot of the key legal questions involved in the lawsuit. And now the state agency is um, you know, offering to try to negotiate a settlement with us. They're offering to produce some records that they had previously said were unavailable. And the case that Andrea just brought up actually of Shane Martinez is a key example of why the public really needs these records. Because we can look at, if we get all the records we're seeking, we can look at these cases that were ruled to be not abuse and neglect and see if that was the appropriate determination. Uh, and in, we know this happens at least sometimes because in the case of Shane Martinez, it started off one way, and at the end of it, they, they they learned more because of the doggedness of her and her lawyer, and they they found out the truth. I want to uh, continue to kind of discuss our some of our other findings uh, with folks as well. Um, with regard to injuries, um, I spent a lot of time with the family of a little boy named Aiden McGivney, who was injured uh, here in a Travis County daycare, outside of Travis County daycare. It's a case that really uh, shocked his parents. It happened at a school called the Goddard School in Western Travis County. They dropped him off 
uh, that morning, of course, believing that they would pick up their healthy baby boy um, that afternoon. But instead, they received a phone call around 445 from the school that Aiden had been burned. And apparently what happened, according to a lawsuit that they subsequently filed against the school, is that Aiden somehow managed to crawl toward a door that became so hot that he burned his hands on the door to the extent that his parents had to rush him to a local hospital. Then he was taken to a burn unit in San Antonio, a specialized pediatric burn unit in San Antonio where he was treated and really uh, received significant injuries that doctors had to treat over the course of several months. Um, his parents do report that fortunately he is healing from what happened. They have engaged in a lawsuit uh, against the school where this happened. We are told that attorneys bet between both sides are in what has been described as final settlement negotiations and nearing a final settlement in this case. But Andrea, the story of Aiden McGivney really also helped highlight the types of injuries children are receiving uh, in daycares as well. And I know that we were able to get some, some statistics that really speak to that issue. Yeah, um, you know, let me just say, you know, first off, it's incredibly difficult to figure out how many injuries occur in daycares. I mean, we can assume that kids are gonna fall, bump into each other, you know, knock their teeth into something. Little kids bump into stuff they're not particularly um, coordinated. However, until recently, the state never asked daycares to report whether or not children had been injured, whether they were serious injuries or non-serious injuries. Uh, that's the kind of information that the state would want for funding, for prevention, for any kind of um, assessment of whether or not there are more caregivers needed. Um, but what we were able eventually to find out was that um, over a 18-month uh, period about 5,000 children were injured uh, in Texas child cares. Of those, 818 were considered to be serious. So they were broken bones, burns, fractures, things like that. Unfortunately, what we're finding at the Statesman as we're reviewing these numbers is that there are different interpretations by child care providers who give this information to the state about what is serious and what is not serious. Meanwhile, in our investigation, we discovered that hundreds of daycares were cited for failing to tell the state and the parent that a child had been injured in child care. Um, they are required to do. So we really don't know what exactly is happening, but the state is trying to get their arms around um, exactly how physically safe children are in child cares and what they can do to help protect them. Again, as part of our series on Watch, this really has been a year-long effort with lots of twists and turns and, and frankly, surprises along the way. I know one of those surprises really uh, we received in recent months toward the end of our reporting, and that was the number of sexual assault cases, sexual abuse cases, uh, against children in which children were victims in Texas daycares. And Andrea, I know you and I spent a lot of time looking into that issue as well, but the numbers were, were frankly very, very surprising and alarming to people. Yeah, um, we asked the state to give us um, the number of confirmed abuse and neglect cases that they had over uh, a 10 year period. And we were expecting to see physical abuse um, or neglect. We weren't expecting to see what we did see, which was that over a 10 year period, 452 children were um, sexually abused. Now that can range anywhere from being shown a pornographic video, uh, which occurred in one case, to an actual physical uh, abuse um, that involved touching or whatever. Um, and so what was interesting about this is that we weren't the only ones that were surprised about this. The State Department of Family and Protective Services, the Health and Human Services Commission kind of acted uh, pretty surprised and alarmed themselves uh, because they didn't realize that, that about 45 children a year were being um, treated in this manner. So um, one thing that concerned us as we learned more about this is that parents do not have to be notified when uh, an incident occurs in that daycare. So for example, 
if a child is sexually abused by either a daycare provider or a person who came into the daycare, which that happens as well. Um, parent, of course, is notified at some point or another, either through the child or, or the daycare. But the parents of the other children do not have to be notified through a letter or verbally or anything like that. There is a, um, a investigation letter that, that has to be prominently posted somewhere in the daycare. But if no one sees that, then then they don't even know what is happening. And we found cases, at least one, in which uh, the state report really did not fully or broadly speak to what is alleged to have occurred at a, at a daycare in Abilene, for example. Yeah, in, in that one particular case, a daycare uh, operator was um, arrested and um, charged uh, because she had been told that one of her employees was being inappropriate with children, but she did not report that. So what, even though she had been criminally charged, they cited her in their records as um, essentially failing to report children at risk. And that's all it says. It doesn't give any details. So any parent who was looking up their record would not see that this person had been um, in trouble for not telling on a, on a potential um, sexual perpetrator. A couple of other points that I wanted to make um, in, in the time we have left and, and invite you both to talk about. Again, this is all in our series on WASH, the result of a year-long investigation by our five-person investigative team here at the Austin American Statesman. But one of the more interesting facets of daycare operations in Texas, we found, is the number of so-called illegal or unlicensed daycares uh, in the state. As Andrea said, that's really uh, one of the areas where her reporting started, at least initially. Sean, I know you spent a lot of time looking into these illegal daycares, and we found a, a case uh, involving a family in Bell County that actually lost um, their child at, at an unlicensed daycare. Sean, can you just talk to us about how those types of facilities really have flourished across the state and 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 why that is absolutely uh i think for a lot of people it starts as a natural thing um they start watching their neighbor's kids or uh, maybe a more distant relative's kids at their house uh, and then they start watching more kids and it never occurs to them to go to the state uh, but there's a lot of other people who realize that they're supposed to go to the state and still don't do that. Um, they are primarily in-home, they're relatively small typically, um, but these are called illegal daycares because they don't tell the state about their business, uh, they don't uh, go through any of the requirements that other daycares uh, have to go through. For instance, if they told the state they would have to get a background check. And um, what is a problem about this is that a lot of the uh, injuries that happen and deaths in particular at daycares occur at these illegal daycares and the state doesn't know about them until something goes wrong. So to and come back with, with Jackson Reed, right? That's right. Uh, it's a perfect example. Jackson Reed um, was a 16 uh, month old child in Bell County who was going to an illegal daycare um, with a woman who was looking after a few kids that were not related to her. Um, and she left the room for an hour to do some chores and he and she left him sleeping behind a closed door in her bedroom in a car seat and um, when she found him he was blue uh, and he died uh, almost two months later uh, after uh, losing a lot of brain brain tissue during that day and the the uh, the operator of that facility went to trial and i know you sat through through some of that that testimony as well that's right. Uh, that trial was in August. Um, so uh, me and a photographer and a videographer, and we went up there and we covered it. And it is tragic when this happens on both sides, obviously for the family who lost a child, but also for the operators. She said it didn't really occur to her or she didn't take it seriously that she needed to get registered with the state. And she told me while we were sitting outside the courtroom, while the jury was deliberating, she was free to walk about. She told me that she wished that she had got registered and that maybe this wouldn't have happened if she had done more training. And that uh, I think is, is one of the saddest parts about that entire story is that on both sides, 
um, you know, this could have been prevented. And Sean, I know that another issue that we uncovered as well is the issue of exactly how many uh, supervising adults there are compared to a child in, in, uh, in a daycare facility. And what we found is that Texas has some of the, the worst uh, ratios among any state in the country with regard to the number of caretakers there must be uh, for each child. Some really striking findings there, right? That's right. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit jargony, so bear with us, but it's really important. It's called ratios because it's the maximum allowed ratio of uh, children to caregivers. So it's how many, how many kids uh, each caregiver can look after. So you see Texas is the top line here, and each column is uh, the age of the children. And the one that really stands out in Texas is the three-year-olds. Imagine being one caregiver, one adult, having to look after 15 three-year-olds. Three-year-olds can get up and run around, can't just have them all sit down. So this uh, line graph here shows you the bottom line is the national recommendations from the National Association for the Education of Youth and Children. And the top line is what Texas has. So the bigger the gap between them for those age groups, that means the more out of whack with the experts' opinions of what the ratios ought to be, uh, Texas is. So now the question becomes, we've done all of this work. We have all of these findings that are new information to the public as well as uh, state officials as well. Where do we go from here? And I wanna ask both of you that question. Andrea, maybe you can take this one first. What is the state already doing to remedy some of these issues that we've uncovered? Well, one of the first things that we brought to the attention of the state was um, this um, issue of an illegal daycare unit that had been created several years ago. Um, this unit had been created to basically search out and find uh, and shut down illegal daycares. Uh, then in 2017, for whatever reason, they shut it down. And so when they did that, the number of illegal daycares that were being identified just plummeted. Then when we talked to them about that, they uh, seem to have acknowledged that they, they need that unit back. So they have essentially planned to ask the legislature for um, several million dollars to reinstate that unit. Um, another thing that we uh, um, came across as a possible solution to potential dangers of cameras in child cares. Right now, um, daycares are not required to have cameras. Uh, and, and by the way, this is a very polarizing topic, the, the notion yeah. of cameras and, and child care facilities. Yeah, well, some people love them. They think, oh, I want to be able to check out a live stream of my baby as he is taking a nap or doing whatever, and I can feel like I am connected to him or her throughout the day. And they love that, and daycares use that as a promotional tool. Um, other daycares feel like they don't want a camera there, not because they intend to do anything bad, but because it feels intrusive to them. And they feel like their relationship should be based on trust and um, not some kind of mechanical oversight. Donna Diaz had hoped that Bibbs and Cribs cameras would give her some answers as to what happened to her son, Shane. Unfortunately, the cameras that Bibbs and Cribs did have, they only had because they were um, afraid that people were stealing from diapers from them at night, so they only turned them on at night, uh, and they never were turned on during the day. So Shauna has essentially gotten a, um, a Texas legislator, uh, Representative Ana Hernandez in um, to uh, take up her cause to make sure that daycares are required to have cameras in all rooms. And Sean, uh, lawmakers, we believe, are also gearing up as well to, to possibly address some of these issues. I know the governor, uh, his office has already said that, that child care and the safety of children in Texas daycares is, is paramount to him. As someone who uh, has covered uh, the state legislature as well, how seriously do you think uh, they are going to take this and how much attention might they give this issue in the upcoming legislative session? It's a great question. It's hard to know how a legislative session will play out before it happens. There's always surprises. But this is uh, hopefully a bipartisan issue. This is about child safety. 
Um, child safety has been one of the few issues over the last few years that have been, you know, a priority for both Democratic and Republican lawmakers, especially around the CPS issue. So you would hope that um, there wouldn't be as many political roadblocks to this. Uh, the rubbing point of the legislature is always money. Everyone thinks everything sounds great until they hear the price tag. So uh, it will be interesting to see whether they're uh, willing to put some state budget dollars behind their words uh, when it gets deeper into the session. But Andrea, just one point we want to make is that while we did find a, a lot of, of issues with some daycares in Texas, obviously we found um, many daycares that do, do a great job and do uh, all they can to keep children safe. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really glad that you brought that up and, and are making that point because, I mean, there are, are a million children in Texas daycare who go home and most of them come home safe and happy. Um, there are daycare providers like Open Door Preschools or Sammy's House uh, where they, they see child care as not babysitting but as preschool um, or pre-kindergarten education. And they really care about the kids and uh, their parents love them. And, and um, the ones that we talked to understood where we were coming from when we told them about these issues, they agreed. These are issues that need to be addressed. But it's also really important to understand that um, this is a system that is um, a lot of times built on trust and it's earned. All right. Well, we want to thank everyone for joining us uh, today to hear us talk about the results again of our year long uh, and really more than a year long investigation called Unwatched in the Austin American Statesman, an unprecedented look at the operations of Texas daycares and how uh, the state and daycare regulators really at times have not done enough to keep Texas children safe. Again, thanks for watching and we hope you'll continue to read our work.